the Irish Republican Army, posing as British soldiers, staged an audacious raid on Gough Barracks. The raiding party infiltrated the armory and, without firing a shot, made off with every single weapon. The Irish Republican Army, the IRA, was alive, rearming and preparing for war against the British Army in Ireland. They were prepared to kill us like there then, so it was, it, was, it was them or us, that was basically the situation it was. We had no, no qualms about that at all. The only person uh, that I had in mind to kill was a soldier who also was standing with a gun in his hand. I didn't regard he had any right to stand in my country with a gun. This is the story of the IRA from 1956 to 1962 and some of the people who waged a guerrilla war on the British Army in Northern Ireland. Those who took part had a profound effect on the future of the Troubles and relations between Ireland and Britain. The results of their actions led to the Irish Civil Rights Movement and paved the way for the Provisional IRA and the descent into brutal sectarian conflict. Three decades after independence and partition, the north and south of Ireland coexisted in stark contrast to one another. The border separating the six counties of Ulster from the rest of Ireland was a constant reminder of the ever-widening gap between the communities it divided. It was an inconvenience to those traveling north or south an open wound to nationalists and, to a small section of the population, a call to violent action. I joined the IRA about 1950, and I joined it because the British Army was occupying six of our counties. And uh, I always believed that they should not be there and that I also believed that the only way to put them out was by an armed and military campaign. He'll make our arm ill air in the Vion. Our species did not rear a fan cock or fan cangle a brishel assassin. We are not going to earn our Ravi Maher in a mask, I guess my uncle, I guess my winter, so we are not going to earn canary in our Ravi Fasta, I guess we money in our master. We felt we could make change, yeah. And um, the change we wanted to make essentially was to get the British out of Northern Ireland. And on that happy day, everything would be well with the world. It was as simple as that for most people. During the 1950s, the Sunday Press came on stream and every weekend they would have some action that took place during the War of Independence. And as a young lad, 14, 15 year old, I was sorry that I wasn't around in those days to take part in these actions. The official ideology of the Southern State was nationalist, Catholic and Republican. The Constitution laid explicit claim to the North. In this context, partition was widely regarded as an enduring evil of British colonialism. The uprising of 1916 was an assertion in arms of the right of the Irish people to be free. Freedom has been secured now over more than five-sixths of the national territory. We confidently hope this will not be long until the whole country is united. As the rest of the world moved towards the Cold War, Irish politicians campaigned against partition, lobbying intensively around the world, but especially in America, 
home to over a million Irish-born emigrants. As part of the campaign, propaganda films like this, secretly shot in the north, were circulated. These pictures were taken in Fintana County Tyrone, not in order to rouse national or social hatreds, but in order to expose part of a system of discrimination imposed with the connivance of the British government. It is imposed in order to maintain partition against the wishes of the majority of the Irish people. Mr. Campbell of Mill Street and some of his children, eight people live here. Mrs. Mullen of Mill Street has eight children all living here. Big families and little houses are normal in these back streets of Fintana. Two thirds of the people of this little town are nationalists. That is to say, they are in favor of unity with the rest of Ireland and against being treated as part of Britain. Here at Craigavon Park, not one house went to a nationalist. Craigavon Park is unionist and unionist it must stay. Only an informed public opinion can destroy the structure of injustice which here in Fintana and throughout the partition territory sustains the unnatural division of Ireland. I'm very happy to be in New York again. It's some 18 years since I was here last. Despite their best efforts, the anti-partitionists failed to raise much support. America, while sympathetic, was unwilling to offend its NATO ally Britain, especially at the behest of a country that had absented itself from the Second World War. With this diplomatic channel closed, the Irish government was left with little but empty rhetoric. Into the vacuum left by the politicians stepped the IRA. All that came out of the anti-partition campaign was that it was a failure. And if you like, it was a further justification to the IRA for armed action in that this effort, which had been backed by the government and the whole society really had achieved nothing. Both the Irish Republican Army and the Southern Irish government shared one goal, the establishment of an all-island state. They both saw themselves as the inheritors of a violent struggle for independence from Britain that had begun in 1916. But the IRA had long been declared an illegal organization because of their opposition to the state and their commitment to achieving a united island through physical force. Lanunt Lyacule, a Vion, Goro Gok Irok, Diana, Go Bunrock Tool, Agus Go Pulitul, Conesha, Elias, Ak Goro Realtis Hasna Ra, Stop Ton Jordan, Tamwidjna Eganis Nashek on the Agus Fanamwidj machine. The IRA underestimated the extent of unionist aversion to Dublin rule. In fact, like most Southerners, the volunteers knew virtually nothing about unionists or unionism. Nero Misha Reeves <laughs> Nashe Konde Agus Nerv Torum from Kens Ice Eit of Vion and Acre. Stokogor Hilmer Gosais Valla of the Temple and Eich. So Nerkumer on her dose Vioring Dol Ar Unsi Harchoran and Akala in Ishkian. The only unionists we were conscious of were those wearing bottle green uniforms and carrying pistols. And uh, the British Army uh, in Northern Ireland and uh, the Beeman. But we weren't really conscious of the unionist people at all. And we didn't know any of them. I certainly knew none of them. The Royal Ulster Constabulary, a quasi-military police force of 2,800 well-armed, well-resourced local men, had over the years amassed considerable intelligence on the nationalist community. Backing up the RUC were the B Specials, over 12,500 armed reservists. Untrained and much more openly sectarian than the police, they were responsible for the deaths of many Republican sympathizers during the sectarian conflict of 1921. Thirty years on, they were still widely feared by the Catholic population. The local men could also call on several thousand British soldiers stationed in barracks around the north. 26 of the counties of Ireland broke away from Great Britain and formed an independent state. 
We in the north of Ireland, with a population of one and a half million people, decided by an overwhelming majority at a great national general election that we would remain within the United Kingdom. We made that decision as a people quite freely and for very definite reasons, reasons that are historical, reasons that are cultural, and reasons that are economic. Arastru Stormadon Sala Kura Hulesh. She and Rodavi on Agasitash Melchinak and Jarku came with Korga Pobli. Kurt Priu Ira Craig Avon, a BSD and Shinner for Blindy Father, that we are a Protestant Parliament for Protestant people. Agasti Kalur, Katslika on Agas, Shin Masla Vion. In the Republic, few enjoyed a high living standard. Many were unemployed. Hundreds emigrated every week. By the end of the 50s, the country had lost half a million people. The country was drained of its young. After 30 years of independence, economically, the country was in a downward spiral. In 1952, hundreds of IRA volunteers attended the annual Republican commemoration at the grave of Republican martyr Wolf Tone, the green shoots of a freshly motivated organization. Responsibility for this revival was down to three leading Republicans, Tony McGann, Thomas McCurtain, and Paddy McLogan. From the IRA's Dublin HQ, the seven-man army council controlled the small but unified IRA movement north and south of the border. Vian Massacum and Vertica, Shilam Gardini Comasakid, Agus near Antic Shile, Ruddy Bioga, Nih Bioga, Vishi Deerhe, Aran Rod Moore, Era Antahe, Agus near Oven Omacola, Plaikiak, Nayan Rod Marshin. The three Macs were conservative IRA veterans who were deeply attached to the nationalist ideals of the War of Independence era. For them, the IRA would be a disciplined army of morally upright volunteers, guided by the single-minded pursuit of a united island by force. They themselves had made sacrifices for their beliefs. Tony McGann had sold his farm to pay for the struggle. It was the money from that, really, that helped to set up the IRA. It was the seed money, if you like, to restructure the organisation. McCurtain, whose father was a martyr of the War of Independence, had a death sentence for murder commuted to eight years of solitary confinement in a southern prison. On release, his belief in the armed Republican struggle was, if anything, even stronger. Violence is no longer, or ever was, the best way, or the most convenient way, or the most comfortable way, yeah. or the most comforting way. But it is the only way. And you say times have changed. Have times changed that much? In the late 40s, McLogan, McCurtain and McGann made two critical policy decisions that would shape the movement for the next 50 years. They subsumed the effectively defunct political party Sinn Féin, along with its newspaper, The United Irishman. From now on, this would be the mouthpiece through which the IRA would impart its message to the nation. Now, we never looked beyond what might happen in the political line. Sinn Féin could deal with that. We had very little to do with Sinn Féin. I was never at a Sinn Féin meeting. Most of those I knew didn't, if you like, have much time for Sinn Féin. The second decision was the introduction of Army Order No. 8, a rule that forbade any military action south of the border. From now on, all energies were to be devoted to a military campaign against the north of Ireland. 
ending partition would be the IRA's raison d'etre. This was a, a tremendous change for the IRA. It focused everything on the north of Ireland. It gave us a great freedom, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I think everybody was very happy that we weren't shooting at people in the south of Ireland. And um, I think it was a, a very wise move at the time. Early in 1954, the IRA received an interesting piece of intelligence. The only thing standing between it and the armory at Gough British Army Barracks in Armagh was a single sentry with no magazine in his gun. Eamon Boyce, the Dublin intelligence officer, was put to work assembling a raiding party. Personally, I went up for six successive weeks and observed the barracks from various vantage points. And we obtained a fair bit of knowledge about the, the setup. And then Charlie Murphy suggested if we could get a man in, into the British Army. That man would be volunteer Sean Garland, who immediately travelled from Dublin to Armagh and joined the Royal Irish Fusiliers. Charlie and I made journeys up, met Garland. He brought us out all the information. He even suggested that we attend a dance on a Friday night, which was attended by all the local girls in Armagh City. We took over 100 photographs with a Minox camera of all aspects of the barracks. Four of us went up in the car and approached the barracks. One of the four got out, went to the, the sentry, held up the sentry. The main body of men stayed in the town in a truck. By extraordinary coincidence, the raid had coincided with the official visit of a high-ranking British Army general. As a result, every weapon in the base had been secured in the armory. And due to the filming which had been done earlier, they knew exactly where to go, opened the armory and held up those in the armory. With the guard overpowered, the truck containing the rest of the team, dressed in a motley assortment of British Army surplus, purchased in a shop in Dublin, was ushered into the base by an IRA volunteer. We took every weapon that was in the barracks. The alarm wasn't raised until uh, four hours later. So the, the soldiers didn't come out, they didn't know what was outside, and they had no weapons anyway. Garland's information was tremendous. The car party, myself and the other three, stayed on for another ten minutes. We locked the guard room, locking the prisoners inside, and left. And uh, I felt very elated. Tony McGann was waiting for us, and he was over the moon, he was astounded. He hadn't really, I think, believed that the raid would succeed. Now, rearmed with British guns, the IRA faced their next challenge. In order to take on the North, it would have to turn its volunteers from raiders into soldiers. At the annual Republican parade, just days after the raid on Gough Barracks, the IRA issued a statement. Let there be no doubt in the mind of any man or woman in Ireland on this matter. These arms were captured by Republican forces for use against the British occupation forces still in Ireland, and they will be used against them, please God, in due course. Having stated their intentions publicly, the IRA leaders began to prepare for armed conflict in Northern Ireland. At camps around the country, hundreds of new recruits went into training. Go make a larger lesson train all. For has to um side your a yen of Jim Hain, Augustan, or not the small 
Korastam, na Gujukh on Trid, Agus Nak Ming Re, Fanakunya, Agus Nak Mach Dohan, Trainala Agam. They could dismantle and assemble a Thompson submachine gun or a 45 in the dark, load it or unload it, the same way with the magazine of the Bren gun. We could load it the darkness of the night, clip in the in the rounds and count the rounds. We were very familiar and very well trained and like that because we'd done it over and over and over again. Like. And there was no doubt but we were training to go into a, a military situation and there would be the likelihood of people being killed or, or imprisoned. The IRA felt that they had the sympathy of the Dublin government and police who were prepared to turn a blind eye, so long as they were no threat to the state in the south. But they were short of ammunition, and in October 1954, acting on information from their spy in the British Army, Fusilier Sean Garland, 19 volunteers from Cork and Dublin in boiler suits with blackened faces broke into Omar barracks. The plan was to infiltrate the armory and fill two waiting lorries with ammunition. Prior to going into Omar, Tony McGann gave one final and very definite instruction. If things went wrong under no circumstances, would any of us accost any civilian any policeman, any be special, only members of the British Army. But the plan failed. Minutes into the raid, the IRA's first gun battle with the British Army since 1921 erupted. There were two lorries and a car waiting outside to take everybody back. The job had failed. I stopped on the road at the back of the two lorries looked back down the road to see if anybody was left behind and with that the lorries moved off. Eight of us were left behind because there was a lot of confusion, men wounded. I found myself on my own. I knew my way to the border. I came down through the Tlacher Valley and I was arrested by a farmer and his five sons and each of them had a rifle pointed at me. In the hugely publicised trial that followed, the eight captured Omar raiders were charged with treason against the Queen. Lengthy sentences were handed down, resulting in a huge surge of support for the IRA. Due to the fact that the authorities charged us with treason, Uh, It gave us a platform to preach, if you like, the Republican gospel. I think the British made a mistake in giving us that platform because, as I said, it was subsequent to that that this huge influx came into the IRA. In August 1955, the IRA struck again, this time in England itself. A raiding party headed by Rory O'Brodick infiltrated Arborfield Barracks in Berkshire. Within two hours, they had captured and tied up 18 British soldiers and driven away two vans loaded with 82,000 rounds of ammunition. We have a blind catch-up in a country for a trade in Aram Hasna. Well, be shot, Aram Hasna, also our Goramak, August Mwinja, Ah, Mule. I guess uh, Fiera here, we ruddy at our lunch. So to be on sauce of, I go all in the lehage. On sauce of good job. The victory was short lived. On the road to London, a suspicious police patrol stopped one of the vans and discovered the hall. Within hours, a TV crew was on hand to record the discovery of an arms dump and the rest of the ammunition. The captured men were given life sentences, resulting in another surge of support for the IRA and Sinn Féin. 
be a pop airy or more in the Europe or a ha Neil Kesh in the hair and Rachel Foss the eternal rebel Tashir Shuligoni it was a great morale boost for us like there then that we suddenly believed like there then we were going to do something because we wouldn't have liked to have been like members of a an IRA like that was never going to 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 do anything like you know so we said it's just time for action in 1956 the IRA finalized a plan it had spent the last year putting in place the brainchild of its most experienced military man former Irish army officer Sean Cronin it was known as operation harvest the IRA felt that the crop had grown to fruition and just needed their hand to gather it in Sean Cronin was a trained military officer, but the difference between the ideal, uh, as he would have it, and what was feasible with what the material, both in terms of equipment and the men that he had, I mean, there was a huge difference between the, the two. And I think in that sense, uh, Operation Harvest was very much aspirational. It envisaged flying columns of up to 25 men crossing the border from the Republic to attack targets in the north, paralyzing the institutions of the state, establishing liberated areas which would be made ungovernable, subsequently forcing the British to leave Ireland. Volunteers left their jobs and homes and mobilized. GHQ relocated from Dublin to the border and four IRA columns crossed into the north, armed with rifles, pistols, machine guns and explosives. Operation Harvest was what became known as the border campaign. It's what most IRA volunteers wanted and were looking for and there were happy when it did start. At midnight on the 12th of December 1956, the IRA War of Liberation began. By dawn, the threat it posed was clear. Throughout the night, the province had been rocked by explosions. Police barracks had been bombed and sprayed with bullets. Bridges, courthouses, and even the BBC radio transmitter at Derry had been destroyed. The governments north and south had been taken totally by surprise, as had the northern IRA, some of whom only found out about the operation the next day, when they were picked up by the RUC. Having arrested all known activists, Stormont moved quickly to introduce internment. Oh, heave Operation Harvest the Hulamudge Amra Bear Operation Harvest, the G Bajer Me Nullig Harfa Ni Jake Ku She Agus and Shin Vesogin Yakro and Blood Corve Ray, the Cor Rubber, but uh heave details near a fame or in your fissive again. The IRA's enemy was Britain and the British Army. But the reality on the ground was that their main adversary was the local RUC and B Special Militiamen. Not only were the IRA in hostile territory, they were up against an enemy with superior communications and local knowledge. On the night of the 30th of December 1956, 19 days into the operation, two flying columns attacked Derelin RUC barracks deploying mines, grenades, machine guns, and rifles. In command of one of the columns was Rory O'Bradach. Near I reading on Baraka Gawal, Kumar Gar Galyorgo, we chorned ye no med. La unsee in a fair barrack. I was in the Yishin, Monomoksha Gaffat Tibisti. Uh, in the course of the attack, John Scally, a young RUC constable, became the first casualty of the campaign. 
The IRA had underestimated the strength of unionist resistance. Soon, they would pay for their mistake. I was mobilised to go to Monaghan uh, for St Stephen's Day, where I joined the Pierce column. We went to a dump to pick up our weapons, and we got a lecture on how to behave in the field. We were strictly to adhere to the Geneva Convention. We were to carry our arms openly, we were to be uniformed, or at least carry an identifying mark. And to that end, we were all given a, a tricolour flash that we saw on our, our shoulders. The day after the Derilin attack, the Pierce flying column drove a hijacked truck towards the RUC barracks at Brookborough. Close to the home of Northern Prime Minister Sir Basil Brooke. As they approached their target, darkness fell. The truck pulled up in the wrong spot. One possibility is they didn't know exactly which building was the barracks. Another possibility is there was children playing on the road. Possibly to avoid the children, they pulled up on the opposite side of the road, away from the children. Sean South was uh, operating the Bren gun. When he moved to the tail gate of the truck, he opened fire on the barracks and he emptied his first magazine. Put his hand down to get his second magazine, there was no magazine there. So he turned to his number two in the band and he spoke in Irish and he said, Na Palerlana, Patrick Cowell na Palerlana. The magazines. Patrick, where are the magazines? Um, these number two quickly got the spare magazines and put them beside Sean and he continued firing. They were only 30 to 40 feet away from an upstairs window where the sergeant of the barracks was and he was able to fire down into the, the milling mass of men. Of the 14 people, he killed two and he wounded four. And uh, from a military point of view, it was great shooting. Sean South was shot in the back from a machine gun fired from over his head. And so the, the fire came in at an angle of roughly 45 degrees, passing by his head and hitting him in the back. Fergal O'Hanlon was shot in the legs. I think he was on the road when he was shot. The IRA column fled for the border leaving behind two dying comrades, Sean South and Fergal O'Hanlon. Helicopters, ground troops and police scoured the countryside. The southern government finally gave in to intense British pressure. The border was sealed and both governments, North and South, ordered the arrest of all known Republicans. The attack on Brookborough RUC barracks showed both the strength and weakness of the IRA. Poor intelligence and blundering tactics may have resulted in a disaster, but quick to rebrand defeat as martyrdom, the Republican movement had once again achieved a resounding emotional victory. In January 1957, at the funeral of Sean South, 50,000 people lined the streets of Limerick. You'd stand by your comrade like through take and tin and you would not. No way would you, would you desert him like what he went through, you were prepared to go through. You felt that solidarity and comradeship like there then, you know. We felt for our comrades that had gone before us like they was doing long prison sentences. We felt we owed it to them to um, make a success of our campaign because we believed at the time like there then, you know, maybe we were young, naive, that... The best way of getting them out of jail was to be successful in what we were out to do, and that was to bring an end to partition and to unite, uh, that the country could unite.
the southern government, a weak coalition, collapsed, leading to a general election. Sinn Féin had their best result in 30 years, polling 70,000 votes and winning four seats. The most significant outcome of the election was that a strong majority government under Eamon de Valera assumed power. De Valera, a former IRA man, sentenced to death in 1916 by the British, had no tolerance for dissidents and no qualms about using repressive measures against the IRA. Now in the summer of 1957, as the IRA campaign threatened to resume, he ordered the mass arrest and internment of Republicans. From this moment on, the fate of the volunteers was sealed. Today, uh, IRA are self-selected or self-appointed, who have no authority from the public at large. In our time, we were fighting an alien authority. Today, these people are fighting Irishmen, and we want to avoid any further possibility of strife or civil war between Irish, whether they're below the border or above the border. Within days, 168 IRA volunteers and supporters were consigned to Corrig internment camp. Among them, McGann, McCurtain and McLogan. A new army council was co-opted, determined to keep the campaign alive at any cost. We're called up then about the end of August then in 57. I often remember like watching lying in waitly all night like there then recording the times and we'd have everything in place then and we decided then to set up an ambush for it and uh, we'd uh, assemble the, the bomb that we were going to use in the, in the ambush and get the volunteers together and draw up a plan and go ahead and all of a sudden like there then when we go the night we'd be ready to go hit it there'd be no patrol had come at all. Despite the impossible odds they were up against, the IRA was not prepared to take the ultimate step and attack the softest target available. By Virginia, a region of a girl occurred the fridge and dawn and doya rushi oginya. Nak kalgu kreja vion, a kalgu and eden, a patient and cheer. Fearing that an attack on the B Special's militiamen would plummet the North into open sectarian conflict, the IRA avoided all contact with them. In some parts of the country, uh, part of, the, of Northern Ireland where I spent uh, many months, uh, the only target available, essentially, was the B-Special Constabulary, but you couldn't touch them. And equally, uh, Belfast was excluded from any activity because of a fear of pogroms, uh, which uh, I think was a legitimate fear. But if you're engaging in a, in a war, you know, you either give it everything you've got or you, you, you know you should you should leave the game really with strong governments north and south and little public support for violence it was becoming more difficult most of the experienced volunteers were interned by now young men with little training were now on the front line the consequences were inevitable. In November 1957, a small active service unit of four met at a safe house in the border town of Edentubba to prepare a mine. I was looking at the explosive and all like that and I was admiring the condition of it like then. It was first class like then. It looked like something freshly out of the factory. And I examined the two alarm clocks and I says to Paul Smith, Lord of Mercy, and Paul, I don't think you should use them. I don't, I don't trust them. I wouldn't feel safe with them, like, you know. And uh, there was a remark passed like there, and then was I nervous or what, like there, then, you know. But that's 
neither here nor there anyhow like then so I was giving up my few little bits and pieces anyhow and I was terribly disappointed I wasn't going on the operation and uh, um, I was saying, we were saying good night to the lads and wishing them safe trip and all and the last words of Paddy Parrell was singing Aaron, my own lovely land Aaron, my own farewell they were the last words Paddy said to me and I go out in the door and sure that night later on then we heard the blast like there then you know And all the shock go crushment then on the coolmer golf less gone. I guess last and spare sous. Former macro we cooiger marv. I guess better call all a garment. Macarja here and Paddy go parile. What he may cross in McCree again on on lashing. We farag more are tradition rather harla. Ak we me Daniel in me inchna. Lano deray less on thread. Aden Tubba was the worst single disaster of the campaign. While crowds grieved for the dead, there was a clear sense with the general public that the victims had given up their lives for nothing. We had no way at that time of harnessing uh, the public except by doing things and expecting them to uh, support us. From a standing start, to start a, a guerrilla war, if you like, or guerrilla activity at least in, in Northern Ireland and expect the people unhesitatingly to accept it. It was too big a leap and it didn't happen. We hadn't the right to expect it really. I think the only man in the street in the north wasn't interested at the time. They, were, they saw it as a, something from the south of Ireland that was imposing on the north. In November 1961, Justice Minister Charles Hockey introduced military courts which handed down long sentences to captured volunteers. The IRA was forced to accept that it would have to stand down or be destroyed. In February 1962, the Army Council ordered arms to be dumped and hostilities to end. For now. Fia Sagging, again, I'm Shin. Gromwich, Ilahar Nastara, Fia Ntaram Lekela, in a harem, Slaan Agging, August Morshinje, August. Via Sagging in our Ninchen Gojokok Siev Nisfjar Gomech Na Konilaka Arantala Nis Forstini Contrija Corsuus Agus is only a harle in Yerandadala. The Irish resistance movement renews its pledge to eternal hostility to the British forces of occupation in Ireland. It calls on the Irish people for increased support and looks forward with confidence to a period of consolidation, expansion and preparation for the final and victorious phase of the struggle for the full freedom of Ireland. After five years of sporadic attacks, ambushes and bombings, the IRA had killed six RUC men and lost eight volunteers, most of them in accidents. Militarily, the IRA had been defeated. But by failing to address the root cause of the IRA campaign, London, Dublin and Stormont had merely dealt superficially with the beginnings of a devastating movement. We had too many morals. As I said before, we couldn't win a war. We had too many scruples. Terrible things happened in the, in the 70s and 80s. Awful things happened that no way could I, or I suppose anybody else, condone. But I do understand. I do understand why they happened. I, I personally, 
I couldn't have anything to do with them or approve in any kind of way, but I do understand exactly why they happened. If I were asked the question, uh, all that has happened in the last 30 years, uh, since 1969, uh, to know, has it been worth it? I'd have to say no, it hasn't. I don't think so. I think too many people died. Too many people died needlessly. Uh, there were too many innocent people killed in the in the, in the whole uh, struggle, and it's very hard to justify it in terms of what has been now achieved. I think people are more realistic now, and they are, I think, generally speaking, prepared to settle for less than we would have settled for in our time, or an earlier generation would have settled for either. It's been a very painful, very sore learning experience for the whole society, North and South, particularly for the North. In just a few moments, the conclusion of the graphic history of the Gestapo reflects the growing desperation of some of its officers as the Third Reich began to crumble and fall, but for many, it was business as usual. <laughs> <laughs>